They're making slime. So the title for this morning's message is, Does He Mean Physically or Spiritually? And, and I think that that's an important question because sometimes when we read through biblical passages, we have a predisposition to a worldly mindset. We do. We, we spend all week long in the world, thinking about the world, living in the world, existing in the world. And then when we come together corporately for worship, sometimes we, we, we bring that mindset with us. And this is just one of those things where I'm, I'm going to start. I'm starting this morning with a couple of historical figures and quotes from these historical figures. The, the first two are, are going to be non-religious, and the third one actually comes from Scripture. So we're going to talk about the difference between physical and spiritual reality. And this is one of those things where like, you only have this conversation in church. You really do. You have this conversation in church about the difference between the physical world and the spiritual world. And then nine times out of ten all week long, you live in the physical world, and you, you seem to forget about the spiritual world. And I'm not, I'm not saying that as a derogatory. I'm not picking on anybody. I just I think that today we're going to focus a little bit on how God actually intends for us and what God actually intends for us to do in the physical world that yields spiritual results. Uh, and, and I hope that this is a different perspective on some of these biblical passages because I'm going to be sharing with you this morning. We're going to start in the book of Joshua, then we're going to go to Judges, and we're going to be in Chronicles, and we're going to be in Corinthians, and we're going to end up in Deuteronomy. So we're going to start in the Old Testament, we're going to end up in the Old Testament. So I, I'm going through biblical passages that I believe everyone here is familiar with. But I'm going to try and present them in a way that gives you a slightly different perspective. And, and if, if this works out well, uh, man, I'll be surprised. <laughs> but as long as it works out so that God's the center, it's going to be okay. So uh, I'm, I'm going to ask, uh, Brother Gary, would you mind opening us in a word of prayer before we begin the reading? Amen. Okay, so this morning's first quote is actually coming from uh, an author, a civil rights activist, and, and uh, a poet that's very well known. Uh, it's uh, Maya Angelou. <clears throat> this was a quote from 2008 when Maya Angelou gave the commencement uh, speech to a group of graduating seniors from college. And this is one of the quotes that has stuck with us since that time. Courage is the most important of all virtues, because without courage, you can't practice any other virtue consistently. Now, I, I love to hear Maya Angelou read. I, I think that she, she has just this, this voice of an angel, really, and, and I, I love to hear her read. And in this particular instance, I, I was glad that she was addressing courage with a group of graduating seniors because this is one of those things, ladies and gentlemen, that, that man, in, in the modern world, I don't think we address courage. I don't think we talk about courage. I, I don't think that we actually even stole it as a virtue any longer. I think that this is one of those things that when we watch The Wizard of Oz, we will talk about courage for the cowardly lion. And outside of that, I don't know that courage comes up in our weekly routine. And ladies and gentlemen, I, I wish it would. I really do. Because this is something that at this juncture in my life, uh, I'm tired of politics. <laughs> I am. Uh, and, and I'm tired of the, the pattern that politics has. 
And I think that if this pattern is going to change, it's going to require courage. It really is. And it's going to require courage on the part of Christians to be willing to speak out for the truth of the Word of God in such a powerful way that the rest of the world actually gets the message. So Maya Angelou's quote was, Courage is the most important of all virtues because without courage you cannot practice any other virtue consistently. So the next gentleman that I picked a quote from is Winston Churchill. And I don't know if you guys know how much I really admire Winston Churchill. I can listen to his fireside chats and I can get, I can get motivated to go and fight World War II all over my, my, myself. Like Winston Churchill just has this, he has this way of delivering inspirational speeches that, that really I wish I could do as well as he did in World War II, to take that little bitty tiny, tiny island of England and to stand against all of Europe and, and then every day to come back to them and, and to inspire them again. It, Winston Churchill, is, he's one of my favorites in history. He really is. So in 1931, Winston Churchill wrote an article, and he wrote an article about King Philip the Thirteenth. That's not important, but in his article he said... Courage is rightly esteemed the first of human qualities, as has been said, because it is the quality which guarantees all others. Courage. Maya Angelou in 2008 thought it was important enough when she was 80 years old to talk to a group of graduating seniors about courage. Winston Churchill, in 1931, having no idea he was going to be leading the free world during World War II, being bombed almost nightly by the German Air Force. Had no idea that what he was saying in 1931, I believe, would still resonate in 2020. But I believe it does because he says, courage is rightly esteemed the first of human qualities because it's a quality which guarantees all others. And, and, and think about that. I went through a lot of different quotes for courage. I really did. And, and there were some older quotes than this. <clears throat> but, but these two stood out to me. And, and then I, I'm going to try and draw us into a spiritual perspective now. Because I think that both Winston Churchill and I think Maya Angelou actually had some influences from the Word of God out of the book of Joshua. So if we could now open our Bibles to Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1. Very specifically, I'm going to be reading verse 7. And this is one of those things, usually if you're talking about courage, you go to Joshua chapter 1, you go to verse 9. But I think verse 7 is actually a better illustration here. <clears throat> In this particular instance, I want you guys to realize that Joshua is being spoken to by God. So the instructions that we're reading here in Joshua chapter 1 verse 7 were instructions from God to Joshua. <clears throat> Joshua chapter 1, verse 7. Only be strong and very courageous, that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Okay, so this is the part of the message where I'm really going to get excited. I really am. I want you guys to think about this for just a second. This is God speaking to Joshua. This is recorded in our Bible so that we have the ability to hear the word of God. And God says, only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. I'm not at point one yet, but I'm getting close and I'm trying not to get there too fast because in this particular instance, whoo, did you hear what God just said? He said it's going to take courage on our part to do what God had instructed us to do. This is one of those things that people generally don't think of as the Christian faith as being a courageous faith. But I want you to think about all of the things through history that Christians had to endure. The, the, the Christian faith is not 
a wimpy faith. It, it, it's not one of those things where you can come in and you can sit down and you can read the word of God and then you can go home and then you can see some wrong in the world and you don't do anything about it. You think, well, I'll just pray about it. No, God's not asking you just to pray about those things that you see are wrong. He's telling us very specifically in Joshua chapter 1, the things that you are going to be required to do, the things that I'm going to ask of you are going to require you to have some courage, some intestinal fortitude, some gumption, some get up and go. And then he says very specifically, I want you to know how you're supposed to address this. I want you to understand very specifically, I'm talking about the law that I've already given you. He says it's going to require courage on our part to obey the word of God. It's not going to be easy to do what God wants you to do. The rest of the world might have no vested interest in you doing what God wants you to do. L let's just be honest. When you woke up this morning, was your first thought, man, I can't wait to get to church? Or was your first thought, do I have to go? I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I see some smiles. Only be strong and very courageous. Why? So that you can observe to do. Not watch, but to do. Be strong and very courageous so that you can observe to do all of the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Continuing in verse 7. gets a little more specific. And do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. Now, this is one of those things, if you've never underlined in your Bible before, underline Joshua chapter 1, verse 7, because I want you to see here, he gives you a set of instructions. He tells you it's going to be difficult, and then he promises you, you'll be successful if you do it. He says, you may prosper wherever you go if you have courage, if you're strong, if you can obey the word of the law that Moses has handed to you. He says, then you will prosper wherever you go. Now, this is one of those things, this, this really, it's like a threefold message in just one particular verse. And I have a lot more verses, but we're going to be here for a minute. I want you to think about what it is God has written down for us in Joshua chapter 1, verse 7. He's telling us that we are going to be required to have courage. He's asking us to take that courage and to put it into practice, to do what he says we're supposed to do. And then he says, if you take that courage that I'm asking you to have and you put it into practice, then you will be successful. And he says, wherever you go. Now, there's something about this you have to understand. This wherever you go means wherever we go, we're bringing God's law with us. We're not running away from it. We're taking it with us. We've instilled it in our hearts and in our minds that we have an understanding that when God wrote out these things that we're supposed to do, he says, look, this is not going to be easy. It's going to require some courage. But if you actually do it, you will prosper wherever you go. In practical terms, let me make that a little more realistic for you. When you go to work, you don't leave the Word of God at home if you want to prosper. When you go to the doctor's office, you don't leave the Word of God at home if you want to prosper. On date night, ladies and gentlemen, you don't leave the Word of God at home. You take it with you if you want to prosper. This is one of those truths in Scripture that we read through this particular passage and we think, oh, this is great. God is actually talking to Joshua. And then we read through the whole passage and we pay no attention to God talking to us. I mean, he's actually saying, look, this is going to require some courage on your part to live the Christian life. It ain't easy. It's not. It wasn't designed to be easy. It actually was designed to be hard. It was designed so that it would require some courage on our part to live it out. We are not just required to come in here and sit down and act like nothing really changes when we leave this particular place because wherever we go, we should plan on prospering because we're bringing the Word of God with us when we get there. That's one of those things, ladies and gentlemen, like... 
This is one of those truths in life I wish I would have learned in kindergarten. So it's one of those truths in life that, that my mom and my dad didn't teach me. This is one of those truths in life that if we can sit here and we can agree that this is what the Word of God is saying, because it is, ladies and gentlemen. If you have a commentary Bible, read your commentary. If you want to go home and look up 600 other verses that correspond, you can do it. This is what the Word of God is telling us. He is telling us that the Christian life is going to require that we demonstrate some courage. Let me make it a little more practical for you. It's not always politically correct to be Christian. But politics doesn't get anybody into heaven. It just doesn't. So we need to decide whether we're going to live our lives for the greater glory of God with some courage or whether we're just going to go along through this life waiting for whatever happens next. And this is one of those truths between physical and spiritual. See, we get so involved with the physical world that we don't think about the spiritual application. But I want you to understand that like your body was created for more than just momentary happiness. It was. Your body was created to teach you the spiritual attributes that you're going to require for eternity in heaven. This is a proving ground that we have right here, right now, in, in the very presence of our brothers and sisters in Christ so that we can have the ability to say, you know what, I don't always get it right, but I'm trying. And it requires courage. From Joshua chapter 1. Oh, yeah, and I was going to tell you this, too. So we did Maya Angelou in 2008, and we did Winston Churchill in 1931. This is God in 1400 B.C., roughly 3,420 years ago. So I, I, I believe that when Winston Churchill was giving us his quote about courage, that he was drawing from the Word of God. I believe that when Maya Angelou was giving us her quote on courage, that she was drawing from the Word of God. Because the Word of God has been here since the very beginning. And ladies and gentlemen, this is one of those truths in life. When you see somebody display courage, you recognize it. You see it right away. Like that person right there. Wow, they're brave firemen and police officers running into a burning building September 11th 2001 they were demonstrating what I believe was godly character by not paying attention to their own potential harm but sacrificing their lives to help somebody else the very biblical definition of love ladies and gentlemen requires courage <clears throat> so from Joshua chapter 1 we're going to go to 1st Chronicles we're going to go all the way to chapter 28 so you're, you're in the Old Testament you're going to turn to your right you're going to go through the book of Ruth 1st Samuel, 2nd Samuel, 1st Kings 2nd Kings and then 1st Chronicles 1st Chronicles chapter 28 1 Chronicles chapter 28, go all the way down to verse 20. Now remember the, the, the three quotes that I read to you about courage. The first two probably didn't inspire David very much, but in this particular instance, we have David teaching his son Solomon. And what we see here is David is teaching his son Solomon the, thing, the same thing that God was trying to teach Joshua before he was going to be going into a very difficult trial period of his life. First Chronicles chapter 28, verse 20. And David said to his son Solomon, Be strong and of good courage, and do it. Do not fear 
nor be dismayed. Now, if you had marked Joshua chapter 1, I would ask you to flip back and look at the correlation here between what God was telling Joshua and what David is telling Solomon. He's telling me it's going to require some courage. He says, but be strong and of good courage. And then he says, do it. Well, what did God say in Joshua? He says, look, this is what I want you to do. I want you to be strong. I want you to have courage. And I want you to obey the word of God. I want you to do it. And he says, do not fear and do not be dismayed. So, so what we see here is we see that King David is taking his son Solomon and he's trying to teach him a biblical truth that we were exposed to in the book of Joshua that I wish I had been exposed to earlier in my life that I, I'm, hope, I'm hopeful that each and every person in this room already has been exposed to and has a good understanding of. But in this particular instance, we see that the biblical teaching of God is starting to repeat itself on very important men of God. This was Joshua who was going to be leading the army into the promised land and this is is David, who, who biblically speaking is a man after God's own heart. And what is he teaching his son? He's teaching his son to be strong and to have courage and to get up and do something. What specifically is he talking about? For the Lord God, my God, will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you until you have finished all the work. For the service of the house of the Lord. He's talking about building the first temple. He's talking about King Solomon's gold laden temple. He, he, he's talking about understanding that he's going to have to have courage. This is the king telling his son, who will be king. It's not just good enough that you're going to be in charge. You're going to have to have courage. And you're going to have to do those things that God has asked us to do. And he says, I want you to understand that while you are having courage and while you are doing what God has asked you to do, he says, for the Lord God, my God, will be with you. So God is with us when we are having courage and we are doing those things that God has asked us to do. Didn't that make you excited? Like God is with us when we're doing what he created us to do. And he says, he will not leave you nor forsake you. And he says, until you have finished all the works for the service of the house of the Lord. Now, very specifically, he's talking about the temple there. But I think there's a spiritual application that we can apply in our own personal lives. How, how will we know when we have God with us? When we're displaying the courage to be the Christian we were created to be, working for the greater glory of God, he will not leave you nor forsake you until that work is complete. That's an application for our lives revealed in 1 Chronicles chapter 28. That also brings us to point number one. Point number one. There's purpose for your life. You are not just an accident that happened. There, there is meaning and purpose for your creation. See, God spoke and the worlds leapt into existence. And then, then when those worlds had, had, had been created, God says, I'm going to have to put some people down there on, on that particular place. And there's this garden that I'm going to create and it's going to be perfect. And I'm going to take these people and I'm going to put them into this garden. And God picked mankind and he made Adam and, and, and Eve and then he put them in the garden. And then those two people do what people are really good at. They messed up, amen? And in that respect... Isn't that what we do every day? We just mess up. I mean, we were created to go out and display courage and to complete the work of Christ. And most days we fall short. But we don't have to because God says he will not leave you and he will not forsake you while you are doing your created purpose until that job is done. And I like to put a little different spin on that particular section. When it says he won't leave you and he won't forsake you until that work is complete, at that point, I don't think God says, I'm done with you, I don't need you anymore. At that point, I think God calls you home and things get better. That's how I tend to look at it. <clears throat> 
So from point number one, we're going to go to 1 Corinthians. We have to go into the New Testament because I want you to see that this courage is something that God teaches in the Old Testament. It's something he teaches in the New Testament. So we're going to go <clears throat> to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Continuing in verse 58 knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Okay, so that we're short on time, so that takes us to point two already. And in this particular section, I want you to see that we went from First Chronicles chapter 28 where God was saying that you have something that you're supposed to be doing and you have a way that you're supposed to be doing it. And then as long as you are doing it in that particular way, I'm going to be there with you. And in this particular section, I want you to see that what he's here is he's reminding us from the Old Testament to the New Testament that there are some things, ladies and gentlemen, we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be abounding in the work of the Lord. We're supposed to make sure that our lives are immersed in our created purpose, bringing greater and greater glory to God. And that as we're doing those particular things, that God says that your labor will not be in vain, not your labor that is for the Lord. So point number two for today's message is actually a very simple one. The Lord's work will be complete. Now, I actually intended to spend more time here, and I don't know that I'm going to be able to because I understand what time it is because I looked at my watch. That's my fault. Uh, in this particular instance, I want you to see here that what we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58, is that God is telling us that the work that he starts is the work that he will complete. Now, this is very telling for us as individuals because as individuals, we have free will. And be Sorry, I was just reminded. Because we have free will, it doesn't mean we always do what's right. And then I was reminded that somebody had watched one of my videos, and I'm not going to pick on them or call them out on name, but they said they had watched the first video for New Colony Baptist Church, and they thought that there was something wrong with the audio, that I had been sped up or something. <clears throat> and I said, well, I told them if they say amen, I will slow down, but if you don't say amen, I just figure you got it the first time, so I'm going to keep right on going. So in this particular <laughs> instance... <laughs> The work of the Lord will be complete, but because you have free will, it doesn't mean you're going to take part in completing it. Think about this in, in this particular instance. David wanted to build the first temple, but God told him, no, you can't build it. You're going to let your son build it. So David wanted to take part in the work of the Lord, but because of David's choices, he had been excluded from it. And in that particular instance, ladies and gentlemen, we have to understand that that's a biblical application for us. I'm doing it again. Somebody should have said amen. It's a biblical application for us that the work that God intends to be complete will be complete. Whether or not you choose to take part in it is completely up to you. Like you can make choices that will exclude you from completing the work that God intended for you to complete. But then Jared comes around and he finishes it. Or Seth or Fadi. Or Braxton. <laughs> He's back there making slime. <clears throat> See, the, we have a created purpose, ladies and gentlemen, and that created purpose is to bring greater and greater glory to God. And that glory will be brought to God whether or not you choose to take part in it or not. God's going to complete God's work. The question is, do you want to be part of it? And that's an individual question. It's not a corporate question. I, I don't get to decide for all of the members of New Colony Baptist Church. Every member of New Colony Baptist Church gets to decide for themselves, do I want to be part of the greater work of God? Yes or no? From 1 Corinthians, I want us to go back to Deuteronomy. Everybody turn your Bibles back to the Old Testament.
Deuteronomy chapter 31. We're going to look at verses 6, 7, and 8. And this is one of those things I started in the Old Testament in the book of Joshua, and I'm going to complete my, my sermon today in the Old Testament in the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 6. Be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them, for the Lord your God. Before I turn to, the, to finish the verse, I'm going to read that again. Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 6. Be strong and of good courage. Isn't that exactly what he told us in the book of Joshua? Isn't it exactly what he told us in the book of Chronicles? Isn't it exactly what Jesus continued teaching us in the New Testament? To be strong and of good courage. And then he says, for the Lord your God. He is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. See, God's not just asking us to be strong for no reason. He's not asking us to be courageous for no reason. He's asking us to be strong and courageous because he's with us. And in that particular instance, I, this answers the first part of my, my question today. Is, is, it, is it a spiritual application or is it a physical application? So as long as I live in a physical world, he's asking me to be spiritually strong and he's asking me to be spiritually courageous. Why? Because he's there with me in spirit. So I, I have proving grounds while I'm here. I can open the word of God. And I can see that the word of God says God wants me to be strong and he wants me to be courageous. Why does he want me to be strong and courageous? Because he wants to be with me. Woo! Ladies and gentlemen, he wants to be with you too. It's not just a me thing. Like he wants to be with us and he wants to be with us every day, all day long. He wants us to be with him every day, all day long. He wants us to realize that we were created to bring him greater glory and honor and that while we're doing that, he's there with us and he promises, he promises, he says, you will prosper wherever you go. Now, that is a spiritual application of a physical reality. Because I'm not preaching to you that if you walk into the bank, they're going to give you all of their money. It's not the prosperity gospel. It's the biblical one. Where God says, if you take time to spend with me, I'm there with you. And that that work that I created you to complete, it shall be complete. And that as long as you're working in that work, you will prosper. It's a spiritual application of a physical life, ladies and gentlemen, that is designed to make the Christian unique, different. Not like the rest of the world consumed with the physical world where you will do all day long for 8 or 10 hours something so that you can do something for 10 or 15 minutes that you couldn't wait to get to. And then after that 10 or 15 minutes are up, you're thinking, well, golly, was that it? See, you weren't created for 10 or 15 minutes. You were created for eternity. And, and in that realization, ladies and gentlemen, we were created to have that relationship with God eternally. Not just when we're at church. Not just when we're in Sunday school. Not just when we're in children's church. But all day, every day. And then the work is complete and we prosper. Going on to verse 7. Sorry, I hit it too many times. Then Moses called Joshua and said to him in the sight of all Israel, Be strong and of good courage, for you must go with this people. Seems like we read this a little bit earlier, but it was in Joshua. Huh? So we see here, we see that God has this way of using... God's chosen people to deliver God's chosen message. Because what is Moses telling Joshua other than exactly the same thing God tells Joshua in the next book of the Bible? 
Be strong and of good courage, for you must go with this people. Ladies and gentlemen, look around. Be strong and of good courage, for you must go with this people. Continuing in verse 7. To the land which the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give them, and you shall cause them to inherit it. In this particular instance, I believe that Moses was talking very specifically to Joshua about the promised land. I believe it's recorded in Scripture because in this instance, God is talking to each and every one of us about eternity. Verse 8. And the Lord, he is the one who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Do not fear nor be dismayed. When I started the message off, I was going to I was going to take every verse out of scripture that says to be strong and have good courage, and I was going to go through each and every one of those verses. And I'm honest with you right now, there was too many of them for me to do that. I mean, we, we could, I could have done it. I'm not saying I couldn't do it. I'm just saying you wouldn't sit there for the three hours while I was trying to get them all in. So in this particular instance, I want you to see here that this is a repeated message by God to his people so that we would have the ability to understand that the Christian faith is something, ladies and gentlemen, that requires courage. This is not a wimpy faith. This is the faith that changed the world, ladies and gentlemen. JC, I'm sorry. Can we go ahead and go to point three, Jacob? God says he wants you to be strong and have courage because the whole rest of the world is going to try and stop you. That's it. Like the whole rest of the world is going to try and stop you from being strong and stop you from having courage. The whole rest of the world is going to try and stop you from being successful in God's eyes. And they're going to try and persuade you that the, the opinion of God is not the worldly opinion to have and that you need to be, you need to be prosperous in man's eyes. You need to be focusing on those things that the world is focusing on or else the world is just it's going to fall apart because it needs people to do these things. And ladies and gentlemen, I want you to understand that at the end of the book, in the last chapter, that this world does fall apart and it's part of God's plan. So it's not incumbent upon me to try and save this world. It's not. It's incumbent upon each and every one of us to try and save some poor lost soul so that they know that at the end of this you prosper by going to heaven, not by having the biggest bank account, not by having the nicest job or the flashiest car. You prosper in this life by doing what God created you to do, save some poor lost soul. That's the end of the message because, ladies and gentlemen, that's just the truth. And I, I think that the world needs to do that. And I don't care how many days it is till the next election. I don't, because the next election is not going to change what you were created to do. And it's not going to change your eternal destination. And I promise you, the Word of God says that His work shall be complete, whether you help or not. <laughs> but you're invited to help. <laughs> Miss Peggy, you have a song? Yes, sir. Page 417, Jesus is tenderly calling. Page 417 in your hymnals. If we could, we're going to stand and sing. Brother Virgil, would you come to the front, please? <laughs>